The following podcast is part of a certified educational activity titled Immunotherapy as a Component of Multimodal Therapy in Locally Advanced and Earlier Stages of Lung Cancer. Rationale, Evidence, and Implications for the Multidisciplinary Team. Access the entire activity and complete the post-test at peerview.com forward slash TYJ860. Downloadable slides and practice aids are also available. Hi, I'm Dr. Brendan Stiles. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Cardiothoracic Surgery here at Weill Cornell Medicine, New York Presbyterian Hospital. I'm here to talk to you today about immunotherapy as a component of multimodality therapy and locally advanced in earlier stages of lung cancer. And we hope to go through the rationale, evidence, and implications for the multidisciplinary team, particularly with respect to what surgeons should think about as they approach these trials. There's several key questions that we all have to think about when we manage stage three patients, and even stage two and stage one B patients. I like to think about these as related to two separate aspects. On the one side are patient factors, and on the second side are tumor factors. We all know that these patients perhaps uh, invoke some of the liveliest debate at our tumor boards, but when we think about patients with locally advanced disease, we really have to weigh the individual patient carefully. Patient factors include performance status, weight loss, general comorbidities, particularly with regard to pulmonary function, but also cardiac function. And increasingly, I think we're all considering patient preferences, social and financial factors in our decision, whether or not a patient can be enrolled in a a potentially prolonged neoadjuvant trial. Then, of course, there's tumor factors. These also weigh heavily on our minds with patients with locally advanced disease. Do we have the right stage? That's just so critically important. How was the patient staged? Was a 3A patient ruled out for stage 3B and 3C disease? If we truly have N2 disease, there's differences there as well, as we all know. What's the bulk of the N2 disease? Is it single station or multi-station? That leads into the question, is it technically resectable? Is it technically resectable without a pneumonectomy? Can radiation be delivered to a curative dose? These are all questions that we have to wrestle with at our multidisciplinary tumor boards, really as we craft an individual treatment plan for each patient. Probably the most important thing to recognize when we talk about stage three lung cancer is how heterogeneous the disease really is. This diagram gets at that a little bit, but we know that stage three disease can be very different. There are superior sulcus tumors, chest wall tumors, T3N1, T3N1 inoperable, T4N0, N1, N2 disease, and then there's N3 disease, which falls into 3B and 3C. All of these can have potentially different pathways to get to for surgeons, for medical oncologists, and for radiation oncologists. Working our way through them and deciding the best pathway for each patient is really critical and really does take a multidisciplinary team effort in order to determine how we should think about each patient individually. And we know that there's many different options to treat these patients. Sometimes upfront surgery followed by adjuvant therapy, sometimes neoadjuvant therapy followed by surgery, and sometimes definitive chemotherapy and radiation. And now, of course, we have the option for adjuvant immunotherapy after chemo radiation. So how do we set the stage for a discussion of how to treat patients with stage three lung cancer? This again, as I mentioned, always prompts a lot of debates. If one historically looks at the Albane study, the intergroup study, um, which is a well-known study to most out there, you can certainly make an argument that maybe surgery doesn't have a role or has a minimal role. They basically showed that if patients were treated with chemotherapy and radiation, they had equivalent overall survival to those treated with chemotherapy, radiation, and surgery. Many people interpret that as as being a suggestion that you don't need surgery in stage three disease, that it's a largely systemic disease and that local control can be equivalent with radiation therapy. And I I certainly get and understand that argument. I think where some nuance comes in is is the idea of of what are the other endpoints. And yes, the study was empowered to do these, but for progression-free survival, we certainly saw an advantage with surgery. Um, We would expect that surgery would perhaps provide improved local control and the hazard ratio for that was 0.77. But I think more nuanced is this idea of perhaps a lesser resection. Surgeons maybe have a pneumonectomy problem. Certainly in the Albane trial, there was. There was a 35% rate of pneumonectomy in the surgical arm. 14 of 16 perioperative deaths were following pneumonectomy. And the mortality over pneumonectomy in general was 26%. Certainly we can now do better than that. And and pneumonectomy mortality rates are generally less than 10%. Um, I strongly feel that if if we can treat a patient with stage three disease with a lobectomy, that it's worth considering. 
If you look at the subgroup analysis from the Albain study, it shows the same. Patients undergoing lobectomy versus the matched cohort had a significant benefit in overall survival. So I, I tend to think of stage three disease as resectable by pneumonectomy versus resectable by lobectomy. And I tend to move patients forward based upon that algorithm in my mind. Certainly I'm more likely to entertain a lobectomy versus a pneumonectomy for these patients. If one needs to consider a pneumonectomy, perhaps they are better served going the chemo radiation route. Now, in order to frame this conversation with Pacific trial, it's a really important trial. It was the first perhaps to advance immunotherapy into early stage disease and show a clear benefit. This wasn't a surgical trial, but this was definitive chemo radiation followed by essentially adjuvant dervalumab. And you can see overall survival, which is presented here, patients who went on to receive dervalumab after chemo radiation had a significant survival benefit with a hazard ratio of 0.68. If you look at the placebo arm, you can see how well they do with just chemo radiation. Re sort of uh, asked the question, do we need surgery? Can we do better? Immunotherapy clearly plays a role here, but what about immunotherapy and surgery? Could it do perhaps even better than this arm getting chemo radiation? and dervalumab. Dervalumab is not the only drug moving into stage three disease. Pembrolizumab has also been approved for stage three disease um, based on the results of Keynote 42. And then we also heard a trial of concurrent chemo radiation and pembrolizumab Keynote 799 that was reported at the recent ASCO meeting. So the overall response rate was 56 to 67%. So a single arm study, but also very encouraging. Now this is what I think about when I think about Pacific and, and, and what does it mean for surgery I think this is an important slide. How did patients fail um, in the Pacific trial? If you look closely at this, you see that we're actually getting quite better at systemic control with the chemotherapy and with the dervalumab, but most of the progression, 85% was in the lung and the lymph nodes, suggesting that perhaps there is a role for better local control in these patients with stage three disease. So here's what I think is the fundamental problem with radiation therapy. It's, it's obviously a great treatment for a lot of patients, but it often doesn't kill all the cancer. We know from several trials of neoadjuvant chemo and radiation that the complete path response rates are perhaps lacking and disappointing. Intergroup 0139 had an 18% complete path response rate. SAC 1601 had only a 17% complete pathologic response rate. Now, one could argue that those were perhaps lower dose radiation therapy, 45 gray and 44 gray, but even in studies with higher dose radiation, RTOG 0229, RTOG 0839, over 60 gray, mediastinal nodal clearance was only in about 63% and 57% of patients respectively. The complete path response rates haven't been reported yet for those studies, but it's only about 25% according to one of the authors. Clearly, there's some situations in which we could do better with local control. Obviously, complete path response is not perfect surrogate for ongoing cell cell death, but it is certainly something that bothers me in these studies is that we still think that there's viable tumor many weeks after treatment. So that means perhaps we could do better with surgery. We know that we can take a lot of these tumors out, but can we do better with systemic control? Can we improve our response? And particularly, can we improve the immune response in these tumors? So one can imagine with all the excitement generated over the Pacific trial and with the idea of moving immunotherapy into earlier stage disease, that the perioperative space is pretty crowded. There's multiple trials ongoing, both in the adjuvant and neoadjuvant setting. ANVIL, Empower 10, BR31, PEARLS, all testing all the different types of, of immunotherapy that we've already heard so much about in the stage four setting. And then there's several neoadjuvant trials, often um, with adjuvant immunotherapy, some without, the Checkmate 816, LCMC3, Empower 30, and Keynote 671. All of these trials are almost in a race to determine how can we best treat patients with neoadjuvant or adjuvant therapy? What's the best setting and what's the best combination? For me, when I look at the landscape, I really favor neoadjuvant trials. I think there's strong rationale for why neoadjuvant would perhaps be better than adjuvant therapy. On the one hand, it gives us a chance to treat patients with a lower disease burden and an intact immune system. The T cell response generated against an in situ primary tumor with a diverse antigen load makes a lot more sense to me than giving immunotherapy after the tumor and the tumor bed have been resected. I think neoadjuvant therapy is generally better tolerated than adjuvant therapy. And I think it allows for fast endpoints to assess response. Um, and this allows for a change of therapy potentially if a patient's not responding. And finally, I think neoadjuvant studies really give us a tremendous opportunity to perform translational studies for biologic and immunologic correlative studies.
This can allow us to compare pretreatment biopsy specimens with resected post-treatment tumor specimens and to determine predictors of response and mechanisms of resistance. So with the potential benefits of neoadjuvant immunotherapy well established, the questions become, what do surgeons need to know? Are there practical aspects that would help us choose the right patients to enroll in these trials? Are there things that we need to know about safety or surgical approach? With that in mind, I thought surgeons should be able to answer the following questions. Which patients should we include? What's the optimal duration and optimal combination of neoadjuvant therapy? What side effects should be anticipated and will patients even make it to surgery? How should clinical response be assessed? And what is the best surgical approach and is fibrosis a concern? And are perioperative complications higher in this setting of neoadjuvant immunotherapy? So first let's tackle the question, which patients should we consider? Most of the trials have included patients with stage 1B to 3A cancer. Certainly, I think one can make an argument that stage two and three patients should be given a shot at neoadjuvant immunotherapy. The 1B group is a little bit harder for me. Um, I don't really have any problem with a solid, highly pedavid, large 1B tumor being enrolled, but I'm a little bit more reluctant for stage one in general to enter these patients into immunotherapy trials. I think another important question is, is what is resectability? We don't wanna err on the side of adding patients to the trial who we think are marginally resectable, who we wanna see if we can make them resectable. We all tend to agree that these agents, immunotherapy and chemotherapy, don't really make patients more resectable. Um, in fact, sometimes it may make determining that a little bit more challenging in the operating room, in my opinion. PDL1 expression may not matter for these patients, and I think we should carefully consider what we do with patients with driver mutations, EGFR, ALK, ROS1, and others. And obviously, surgeons need to carefully screen for immune-related disorders as we consider which patients to enroll in these trials. So this is an important point. This is from the LCMC3 interim analysis. It just gets to the idea that PDL1 may not make a difference. It's obviously tempting to want to know and to, to suggest that a patient with a high PDL1 may be most likely to respond. But you see in this graph that patients with high PDL1, several didn't respond, and this is single agent atezolizumab given in the LCMC3 study. Um, but also you see that patients who had very low PDL1 expression, some had quite a nice pathologic regression. Now, some of the studies have suggested that PDL1 may be important. This one clearly does not, and this is one of the largest done. I think the simple answer is we just don't know. And so I think at this point, I strongly support enrolling high and low patients. Another thing to consider is that for patients who get combined therapy with chemotherapy or chemoradiation and immunotherapy, we don't really know the effect of those things on PDL1 expression. And so I think it's very much a moving target. Now, another question that commonly arises is what do we do with never smoking patients? What do we do with patients with driver mutations? Certainly some patients with EGFR or ALK um, rearrangements have been included in some of the early studies, but in general, the results with those patients have been fairly disappointing with very few um, complete or major path pathologic response rates reported. That said, a most recent study from Columbia did report response in 50% in of the EGFR mutation patients. But for me, I'm still less enthusiastic about including these patients in neoadjuvant trials. I think the Adura trial just presented at ASCO um, further cements that idea that these patients have other options. You probably heard about it, but the idea here was that adjuvant osimertinib was given to patients with stage 2 and 3A disease and even stage 1B patients after resection. And really, there was a remarkable difference in disease-free survival. Now, the study has been criticized for not yet getting to overall survival and not using that as an endpoint. But I still think this is pretty hard to ignore, a hazard ratio of 0 0.17 um, for patients with stage 2 and 3A EGFR mutated lung cancer. It's hard for me to argue when you see things like a 90% disease-free survival at two years um, with osimertinib that we should be including these patients in neoadjuvant immunotherapy trials. I think increasingly the field will move towards targeted therapy for patients with, with, with actionable mutations rather than immunotherapy, even in the neoadjuvant space. Now, what's the optimal duration and combination? This is obviously an important question to surgeons. Um, certainly, by extending our treatment, we'll get more responses, which will make oncologists happy and maybe make patients happy. But surgeons get nervous the longer that they have to treat their patients preoperatively. We worry about progression during that time. We worry about development of complications. So it's clearly a balance between the time to respond versus the potential for progression in non-responders. I think another question that often arises is, what's the optimal treatment? Should we give monotherapy, single drug, immunotherapy in two to three cycles? 
that certainly allows us to operate soon. We would expect that side effects would be low. Or should we combine an immune checkpoint inhibitor with chemotherapy? Typically here, we can again give two to three cycles, operate three to four weeks after the final cycle. And that's been shown in the Nadine trial. This is a balance and it's one that we'll increasingly wrestle with. We'll talk about a little bit more as we get farther into the presentation. Again, balance and likelihood of pathologic response versus um, peritreatment complications. But we know that the ma major path response rate is gonna be higher with a combination therapy, immune checkpoint inhibitors plus chemotherapy, which we've seen major path response rates in the 57 to 83%, then for immune checkpoint blockade alone, which we've seen it in the 15% to 45% range. How that translates to long-term survival, we really don't know yet. Again, major path response is, is a correlative endpoint and may not be completely reflective of survival, but that's something that we're learning now. Well, what are the side effects and the dropout rates um, in neoadjuvant immunotherapy trials? In general, these drugs are remarkably well tolerated, but immune-related adverse events may manifest in various organ systems. Probably the one that surgeons should worry about the most is pneumonitis. It's roughly a 5% rate, but maybe higher with combination therapy. But we also see endocrinopathies, GI, and cardiovascular toxicities. In general, though, if we look across the neoadjuvant studies that have been completed or are ongoing, the dropout rate has been about 10%. However, some patients may also progress, leading to a combined no potentially curative surgery rates of 14 to 19%. And this means patients either develop metastatic disease while undergoing treatment, or they're um, explored and found to be unresectable, or they undergo an, an R1 or R2 resection. There was a, an interesting example of that just presented at the AATS meeting in 2020, the virtual meeting, um, the TOP1501 trial, which was 30 patients um, treated with pembrolizumab only, and only 25 or 30 made it to the operating room, so 83%. And of those, only 22 had an R0 resection, so just 73% of the entire group that was enrolled. I, I do think this is something that surgeons will have to wrestle with. I think we have a natural tendency to enroll patients with heavy disease burdens in these trials. And so I'm, I'm not so surprised to see patients progressing or not making it um, to definitive surgery, but it's something we'll need to continue to look at carefully and certainly non-resection rates of 25% should be concerning to surgeons in this space. Now, here's the LCMC3 interim analysis of adverse events, just to give you a sense of the types of, of uh, drug-related effects that we see in a single-agent trial. And again, a reminder, this is single-agent atezolizumab. Um, All-cause adverse events, grade three to four, you can see in 29% of patients. Um, serious adverse events, 30% of patients but those leading to treatment withdrawal, only 5% of patients. And you can see to the right, that there's a list of the adverse events with greater than a 5% incidence. And most common fatigue, um, fevers, decreased appetite. Um, the types of things that we really worry about, pneumonitis, really low, 3%, again, with this single agent study. So if you think about these in the context of chemotherapy, these are certainly very low and very tolerable. So how does it look then if you, if you combine uh, neoadjuvant immunotherapy with chemotherapy. And this is the study that was just reported from Columbia with uh, atezolizumab and nab paclitaxel and carboplatin. It was just uh, published in the Lancet Oncology just a few weeks ago. And these are the side effects when you combine that drug with chemotherapy. Really not that different from what we saw in LCMC3. You can see even lower perhaps rates of grade three for adverse events. The one that stands out is obviously neutropenia, which is not surprising given the chemotherapy included in this regimen. But again, these drugs are pretty well tolerated. And as we've increasingly, or as oncologists have increasingly learned to give chemotherapy well, we can see that we're getting a lot of patients through um, to surgery with minimal side effects from induction therapy. So once we've gotten patients safely through the neoadjuvant treatment, how do we assess clinical response? How do we know if they've responded? How do we understand if they've potentially even progressed? Well, I think that there's lots of things for surgeons to consider, for medical oncologists to consider. First is the radiographic restaging with CT or PET. This has commonly been used in all of the major trials that have been reported so far. Many have looked at RECIFT criteria, but not particularly found it to be useful in determining response to immunotherapy, as has been discussed early on with imaging in the stage four set quite difficult to predict major pathologic response, although as I mentioned, we see a greater response with immune checkpoint inhibition and chemotherapy. But there's also reports of hyperprogression or of pseudoprogression that make reassessment somewhat challenging, and I'll talk about that in some of the next few slides. 
There's particularly this concept of nodal immune flare, which was introduced um, by the investigators in the NeoStar trial. Either way, this makes the important point that it's important to confirm any expected progression of disease and to rule it in or to rule it out. So this is from the, the first trial from Memorial Sloan Kettering and Johns Hopkins, the New England Journal paper. And they strongly made the argument that radiographic response is not predictive of overall response. And you can see in the panel to the left, patient one had a really nice radiographic response, um, but they still had residual disease. But that patient had a complete pathologic response in the tumor but unfortunately still had residual nodal disease. The patient on the right, patient number five, is interesting in that it looked like this patient progressed. The tumor got bigger, and you can see part of the necrosis in the middle of the tumor. But this patient also had a major pathologic response with 90% tumor regression. Um, imaging is challenging. Sometimes these tumors get bigger. Sometimes they get more pedavid as they go through cycles of inflammation. So it's difficult to pin everything on pretreatment or post-treatment imaging. I'm a strong believer in making the decision up front and then um, proceeding through surgery. Now, one thing that potentially gets in the way with that is this concept of nodal immune flare. The NeoStar investigators described this idea of seeing seeming progression in the lymph nodes or even in the lung after treatment with immunotherapy. Um, and I'll remind you that NeoStar included one arm with nivolumab and one arm with nivolumab plus, plus ipilimumab. Um, and they basically saw that several of these patients developed lymph nodes with granulomas that were pet avid and looked like progression of disease, but were not actually progression. That really emphasizes the importance of if you see pet positive disease after treatment, you have to confirm it pathologically. And we've seen that in our own trial here at Cornell, where we've seen even lung lesions um, that look like progression that turned out to just be granuloma. So I do believe that this is a real phenomenon and merits close investigation. So with all that in mind, we've chosen our patients, we've staged our patients, we've re-looked at them. Well, what's the best surgical approach and is fibrosis a concern? Meaning, are these cases more challenging? There's, we, there's almost an urban legend that it's incredibly hard to operate on these patients after neoadjuvant immunotherapy, and it makes a lot of surgeons uncomfortable. I think because of that idea, the surgeon has to use the, the approach that he or she is most comfortable with. There's um, no sort of extra marks for doing this minimally invasively. I think you do the operation that you can do the safest and the most expeditiously. Um, certainly these operations can be done um, thoracoscopically or robotically, um, but I think one should expect a reasonably high rate of conversions in this patient population with heavy burdens of nodal disease. And it remains to be determined which variables affect the operative difficulty. Um, certainly hyalur nodal involvement, involvement of, of nodes along the pulmonary artery um, and particularly those who have a significant treatment effect, may play a role in, in the challenging uh, nature of the operation. That said, I think pneumonectomy should be performed with caution. When we can dissect those lymph nodes away from the pulmonary artery, I think it's, it's the optimal way to do it. Does immunotherapy make that harder and stickier and more difficult to determine the planes? I think we just don't quite know the answer to that. We've tried to look in our own setting at Cornell and and we know that operations are hard post neoadjuvant therapy, post induction. I think as, as people's minds have shifted to immunotherapy, there's almost a sense that they're harder. But we ask the question is it really any harder or different than operations done with neoadjuvant chemotherapy? And we tried to go back and grade fibrosis in each of these cohorts. And we really found that it wasn't particularly different. Um, certainly, patients who had clinical node positive disease. Um, were judged to be more difficult and, and more fibrosis than those without. But largely, there wasn't a significant difference between patients treated with neoadjuvant immunotherapy and chemotherapy. However, sometimes it does look like this. And you can see the picture on the left. It's almost hard to discern what anything is. This was a middle lobe lobectomy. And, and you can see seeing the right lower lobe pulmonary artery, the right middle lobe pulmonary artery, the bronchus can be very challenging. And often, these tissue plans are completely obliterated. Um, there's a trend in, in our study, at least, towards patients who have a major path response having more severe fibrosis. Probably not surprising. Those who have a major pathologic response are often inflamed. We, we see inflammatory cells in the pathologic specimens. And so it makes sense that those might be more challenging and more difficult cases to undertake. Um, certainly, though, it's reward at the end to find out that those patients had no evidence of disease. So that leads us to the next question. Um, are complication rates higher after neoadjuvant immune checkpoint inhibition? Again, this is something that I, that I think a lot of people have focused on and thought about and, and asked themselves. But really, if you look at the larger studies, we see that they're pretty similar to those seen after induction chemotherapy. The most common complications are the ones that we see routinely after surgery, atrial fibrillation, UTIs, pneumonias, 
median length of stay and most of the trials reported to date have been similar to what we typically see with lung cancer operations, four to five days. Really, there's only been one 30-day mortality in three published series um, and one uh, reported in the NEOSTAR data. So I think these would be as expected for patients with such heavy burden of disease undergoing such complicated operations. To my um, knowledge, based on the data out there, I don't see particularly higher rates of complications and certainly don't see higher rates of mortality than we would expect in this patient population. And these are the types of complications that we see. This is a, a summary by Matt Bott of the, the series that was reported in the New England Journal, specifically looking at the surgical um, aspects of it. And, and you can see that they performed lobectomy in 75% of the patients. They did thoracotomy in 70% and thoracoscopy in 14%. Uh, robotics in 14%. There was a relatively high conversion rate of about 50% in this study. But I think it's important to remember that this was an early study when people were just getting used to the experience and were approaching these patients with caution. As we've moved along, we've seen minimally invasive rates of 50%, um, over 60% in, in our trial here at Cornell. Often depends on the surgeon, it often depends upon the institutional approach, um, but I, I think it's the right thing to have a low threshold to consider conversion. On the right in this slide, you see the um, surgical times, the morbidities, 50% any morbidity sounds high, but really when you break it down and look at it, you see that most AFib, which tends to just be transient, one pulmonary embolism, um, one prolonged air leak, urinary retention. The bigger things that we worry about, myocardial infarction, pulmonary embolism, pneumonia, you can see just happened in one patient each in this study. Those great results reported after neoadjuvant nivolumab were similar after neoadjuvant atezolizumab in the LCMC3 study, where they also reported very low rates of complications with single agent atezolizumab. The bigger question then is what happens if you combine one of these drugs with chemotherapy? And that was the results reported here in the atezolizumab and chemotherapy trial reported by Shu et al. So here, perhaps a you know, higher threshold. Here, we're not just giving one uh, drug neoadjuvant immune checkpoint inhibitor, but rather that plus chemotherapy, and perhaps we would expect higher surgical complications. But you can see this group did quite well as well, and this was a combined study from Columbia and Mass General in the Brigham. Almost half of patients underwent minimally invasive surgery, um, three-fourths had a lobectomy, 25% um, needed a larger parenchymal resection. But again, the surgical complications were quite low, just one mortality in this high-risk group, Length of stay was four days. Only one patient was readmitted. I um, mean, the most common complications, again, were postoperative arrhythmias and urinary tract infections. So certainly these would be numbers that, that many of us surgeons would be proud of to report in an induction um, therapy group. And I think that these operations can be done safely with complications not over and above what we would expect in our typical patients. We tried to look at that as well in our series at Cornell. We compared the group undergoing immunotherapy with a historical group undergoing chemotherapy and looked again across the board to see are there differences. And really, we don't think that there's any differences that are intrinsic to immunotherapy. Now that we've attempted to answer all those questions, I thought it would perhaps be useful to go through some of the published data on neoadjuvant immunotherapy. With that in mind, I'll start with the neoadjuvant PD-1 blockade and resectable lung cancer paper published in the New England Journal by Ford and all. Um, this is the series from Johns Hopkins and Memorial Sloan Kettering describing neoadjuvant nivolumab. Um, the treatment-related adverse events were just in 23% of patients. And importantly for surgeons, there were no treatment-related surgical delays. And this is what caused so much excitement from the paper, really the pathologic assessment of response to neoadjuvant nivolumab. Here, the authors reported a major pathologic response in nine of 20 resected tumors, so 45% really quite remarkable and I think really caused a big stir in the lung cancer community and got people interested in these neoadjuvant immunotherapy trials. Responses occurred in both PDL1 positive and negative tumors. So quite remarkable. And again, I think sets the threshold that, that we shouldn't use PDL1 as a distinguisher of who should or should not be enrolled in these trials. The other thing that's it's interesting here, smoking status, the never smokers are this lighter color. You can see one never smoker had a complete pathologic response. Um, the authors enrolled both patients with adeno and squamous cell cancer. We saw responses across both. And really this trial, again, set the stage for all the trials that had followed that were already accruing in the neoadjuvant space. This trial is not yet published, the LCMC3 trial. This is the interim analysis that was reported at ASCO and some of the surgical results were reported at the AATS in 2019. Similar concept though, I think neoadjuvant atezolizumab in resectable non-small cell lung cancer 
The important part about this study is that it's a multi-center trial. Instead of a single institution trial, lots and lots of centers contributing patients really showing that this technique, that this strategy of neoadjuvant immunotherapy could be disseminated widely. Obviously, these are centers that had a lot of expertise, um, but still I think that, that the techniques across the board and the results across the board were really quite nice. The one thing from this that, that perhaps dampened enthusiasm or maybe reset expectations at least is that the MPR rate, the major path response rate, was not as high. Certainly it wasn't 45%, it was only 19%. The complete pathologic response rate in about 5% of patients. Perhaps that's no different than we would see with neoadjuvant chemotherapy. Um, and about half of patients had greater than 50% pathologic regression. I think a few other interesting points from this study are, again, this idea of patients with driver mutations. Do they have response? Well, three of eight had pathologic regression, but none had a major path response. You can also see that never smokers typically didn't have significant responses. So again, this idea that perhaps patients with driver mutations are not the ones who are most likely to be responsive to neoadjuvant immunotherapy. Now, having covered what I think are the two major trials with, with single agent immune checkpoint inhibitor alone in the neoadjuvant space, I think it's important to move and to consider the idea of combining these drugs with chemotherapy. Certainly, it seems like that's where the field's going. There's been tremendous excitement generated from the Nadine study, the neoadjuvant immunotherapy study. This was a study from Spain for stage 3A resectable non-small cell lung cancer, where patients were given nivolumab, paclitaxel, and carboplatin, and then taken to surgery. They were eligible for adjuvant treatment with nivolumab and for long-term follow-up. This study has been reported several times now at World Lung in 2018, at ASCO in 2019, and really the results are quite remarkable and, and some have said almost unbelievable they're so good. You can see that in this setting with neoadjuvant chemotherapy plus immunotherapy, we see greater clinical responses. So a partial response rate in 72%, a complete response in 6.5% and stable disease in the rest. These radiologic responses also um, were correlated with pathologic response. And this is what got people so excited again this 85% major path response rate in patients treated with neoadjuvant immune checkpoint inhibitor and chemotherapy. The complete pathologic response rate was 71%, so remarkable in this setting, and really would be um, unparalleled in stage three disease. Now, again, the question still remains of how pathologic response rate translates to an overall survival benefit. We certainly believe from other cancers and other tumor types that it likely does but we're all gonna be interested in watching the, the survival data on this trial with a particularly close eye. The one criticism of Nadim is that it hasn't been published yet. Everybody's been waiting to see the results and to see what happens. But I think that people's um, expectations or their concerns got allayed somewhat by the recent publication of this study by authors from Columbia University and from Mass General and the Brigham on neoadjuvant atezolizumab plus chemotherapy. And so this was by Shu et al, just published in Lancet Oncology, and a very similar design. Different drug, atezolizumab versus nivolumab, but also with concurrent chemotherapy. With this study, similar to Nadim, we saw a remarkable major pathologic response rate, approximately 57%, and a 33% complete pathologic response rate. And similar to the other studies, you can see that that occurred in both pdl one positive and pdl one negative patients. This again has energized the field and th this idea of neoadjuvant immunotherapy combined with chemotherapy based on higher major, major pathologic response rates has really led many to embrace the idea that that's gonna be the way moving forward. So to summarize, major pathologic response rates in, in what I think are the major trials or some of the largest trials out there, here they are, neoadjuvant nivolumab, 45% major path response rate and a 15% complete path response rate. Certainly a bit lower in the NeoStar trial with single agent nivolumab. So where that will end up, we're not sure. Neoadjuvant atezolizumab and LCMC3, probably a more expected 19% major pathologic response rate and a 5% complete pathologic response rate. Now onto the combination therapy trials, neoadjuvant atezolizumab plus nab paclitaxel and carboplatin, 30 patients, 57% major path response rate and 33% complete path response rate. And then neoadjuvant chemotherapy plus nivolumab, the Nadim study, a reported 85% major pathologic response rate and 71% complete pathologic response rate. Well, so how should we conclude? I think we should conclude that there's still room for improvement in early stage lung cancer. 
Um, I like this slide. This is a slide that, that demonstrates what we can do with adjuvant chemotherapy for patients with early stage lung cancer. Um, you can see that a lot of patients can survive and be cured with surgery alone. Those are patients who survive without chemotherapy. Obviously, we do better in stage 1B disease and worse in stage 3 disease, but surgery can still be curative. If we add chemotherapy to that, we can do a little bit better. We know that adjuvant chemotherapy probably overall adds about a 5% survival advantage, maybe as high as 10 to 12% in selected patients. And we also know that if we add chemotherapy in the neoadjuvant setting, we can also get about a 5% advantage. But really, do we all want to be left with so much blue on each side? Those are the patients who die with or without chemotherapy. That's really where I think we can do better on the margins, whether that's adding adjuvant or neoadjuvant targeted therapy. The Adura trial is potentially a great example of that. If we give an EGFR TKI to a patient with an EGFR mutation, perhaps we can do better. But I also think neoadjuvant or adjuvant immunotherapy is a space where we can help a lot of patients in this setting. You can see how many patients aren't getting benefit of chemotherapy, aren't getting the full benefit of surgery. That's really the space where surgeons and oncologists need to think about this evolving field of neoadjuvant immunotherapy. We've seen from this talk and from several presentations that it can be done safely, that it, it, patients can be selected carefully for it, and that we can get them through both arms of the treatment. Now I think is really the time to look at the details and to find out better mechanisms of selecting patients, even better ways of treating and predicting response. So thanks everybody for joining. Um, we appreciate your attention. Thank you for listening. Download materials and complete the post-test for instant credit at peerview.com forward slash TYJ860. This activity is supported through educational grants from AstraZeneca, Bristol-Myers Squibb, Genentech, and Merck and & Company, Incorporated. This activity has been jointly provided by Medical Learning Institute, Incorporated, and PVI, Peerview Institute for Medical Education.